Last night, I did not sleep till late. Then I began, so the servants tell me, to cry out, to laugh, to chortle and chuckle in my sleep. I do not remember that. I remember I woke before dawn to find a light, more brilliant than any day, filling the room, its glare so strong my eyes watered at it, my throat burned and my skin was parched. It was as if the sun was shining there where I'd been sleeping, as if God's own voice rang clear in the brightness of heaven. He told me then to dance to him, to lift up my heart and sing, to be like God himself, feminine as well as masculine bride and beloved both. I am Cadmus. This city which 50 years ago I founded is called Thebes. I was a young man. I could not guess what life held for me. I consulted the oracle at Delphi. God spoke through his sacred priestess. He instructed me to build a city here upon rock where spring water issues from the earth. I did this. I killed the serpent which protected the spring. I killed it. Its teeth became seed. I sowed them into the ground at the command of God, and they burst open under my feet and rose to life as men. I remember this. I saw it with my own eyes. I had no son. Long years ago, my eldest daughter, Semele, died in fire. Some say that she was struck by lightning as she lay in the open sleeping on a hot night in midsummer. She was a virgin, untouched by any man. Some say, however, that she bore a son. Zeus came to her by night. He took her as a lover and planted inside her a miraculous boy, a golden celestial child. When told by Zeus that he was king of heaven, Semele did not dare to believe him. For proof, God swore a sacred oath to do whatever thing she required of him. Oh! Let me see you then, radiant, divine, seen as you are seen in heaven. Her body ignited. It became molten light. It burned like the morning star. One thing alone of her was left. Within her womb, a child unborn, untouched by flame, Dionysus. God's own beloved son, the only God not born in heaven. These stories were circulated often 30 years ago. I will not say that I believed them. I am an old man now, tired, forgetful, frequently ill. I abdicated from the throne. I gave the crown to Pentheus, my grandson. Pentheus was born to Agave, my second daughter, whose husband had died young. He took power, boldly, unsqueamishly, with both hands. He laid hold of the priests, the medicine men, and those who make rain by magic, and either killed them or banished them. 
He knew he could not be supreme while these powers remained beneath him, but not subject to his command. He has condemned the stories of Semele's death as lies or blasphemous fantasies. She held in her arms not Zeus, but a mortal man. Her child was a bastard, not the son of God. At first the people obeyed him. They spoke in his voice, saying, It is apt and fit that we put away these ancient things. Such superstition is fit only for a nation of slaves, women and children. Women, slaves, children. These, in their oppression, are heavy with dreams, knowing that they must live like fruit that is eaten. Their minds create a language of longing which finds no expression in action. It is a call not of will, but of need, a plea to be heard by the power of a god. Dionysus has returned. He is here. He is real. He comes whispered, half heard, glimpsed, not openly seen, rumored, expected, yearned for in prayer as saviour, as perfect incarnate God. At night I hear the voices of women. They are singing. Dionysus has heard them. In the secrecy of their prayer, he answers and is there. High upon the summit of Mount Kithiron, in wild and desolate places, they have sought him and found him in the water which has changed its nature and become wine in the hot red blood of the grape, made holy by divine ecstasy. In the frenzy of deliverance, which is the sister of madness. <laughs> We need to see him at once. Immediately. The king is already returning to the city. Say to me what you wish me to say to him. Be brief and be plain. Then, briefly and plainly, religious mania is spreading through Thebes like fire. The smell of disorder is in everyone's nose. Violence, rebellion follows. This may happen very soon if prompt action is not taken by the crown. The king knows there has been trouble. Reports have been dispatched to him, as is usual. But you know the king. He will not be happy until he has taken charge of the situation personally. Let us wait calmly and patiently for the king to return. In my opinion, this fire, as you call it, is too violent to burn for long. You know that the seven gates of Thebes stand open, that the guards in the garrison abandon their weapons, that they sing hymns to heaven like women and children. Can you stop them? Can the king? Can anyone? Welcome, sir. Welcome back to Thebes, my lord. Welcome. I leave my city for a brief, well-merited holiday. I return and everywhere there is anarchy. And you dare to say welcome to me! Listen! Listen to it! There's singing and dancing in the fields. Every tree, every cottage door is hung with flowers. Everywhere, rising like smoke, hymns to Dionysus. Everywhere, the jangling of pipe, tabor, tambourine, flute, the people, naked in the hot sun, no guilt, no shame, addled with wine, the stink of incense, the age-old smell of heat and sex. As I rode toward the city, I met some of these revelers, idling under a tree, laughing for no reason. I shouted, why are you not working? Have you no trade or profession? Do shuttle and loom turn to an industry of their own? Is corn gathered in without the help of men? There was a time when their bowels would have opened for fear. There's more. High in the mountains, little covens of God-struck women perched among rocks like birds, squatting on their haunches, their unkempt hair flowing free, living, sleeping in the open. Only the shade of the heavy pine keeps the weather off them, dreaming of Dionysus. The god, the dancing boy, what sort of man is he then? This 
gypsy from the Orient, this Dionysus, this sweet-smelling youth with his long-scented hair, who thinks he can take the city of Thebes without risking his body in combat? Sir, this is God. Meaning? They think that God has come home. Meaning? They are saying God was born here. God has come back to Thebes. Here, heaven touched a mortal woman with fire, and she gave birth to a saviour, to a, a divine son. They are saying he's here. We've seen him. They are saying milk has poured from rock at the touch of his arm. He can turn stones into bread, water into wine. These people were workers once. Day upon day I observed them at the plough, gashing open the obdurate earth with iron, breaking the brittle stone to build the sheep pen. Their minds, persistent as siege engines, their bodies resilient as leather. And now some pornographic poet's dream of love and wine and indolence and lunatic narcotic bliss in paradise has shattered them. Well, we have a simple way with people like these. We know what to do with them, do we not, gentlemen? Arrest them. Do it. Arrest them all. Sir, it is impossible. What? There are too many of them, sir. We cannot put half of the population in jail. And some of them, sir, are important people whose position would make such action embarrassing. Who? I want their names. Your mother, Agave, is one. Your aunt, Ortenoe, another. Sir, other people are saying it's all right. It's all right if they're doing it. They are women. They can be ignored. There is another, sir. I regret to inform you his place, his distinctions, too high to be ignored. Who? The old king, sir, Cadmus, your grandfather. Nonsense! You are wrong. Sir, it gives me no pleasure to report it, but I swear it is true, sir. I have seen it for myself. A man of 80, sir, dressed in a woman's robes, his white hair garlanded with flowers. weakness in me. By this rough school he put iron into my soul. So at twenty I was judged ready to assume the absolute authority of a king. He put the crown upon my head and knelt and kissed this ring. What influence or what charm has induced him to betray me? Sir, there is a name upon every tongue, a name you have forbidden. Yes, Tiresias, the voice. I should have predicted this. That blind, half-witted, clapped-out, evil-smelling old charlatan is back in Thebes. It was our intention to arrest him, sir, but the crowds proved too strong for us. Cadmus, the father of his country, Cadmus was with him acting as his guide. He led Tiresias by the hand into the city square where Tiresias stood and prophesied. I asked, by what authority, sir, do you allow this vagabond to preach openly in the public square? Cadmus replied, he serves a master greater than the king. Oh, I answered, does he have a name? His name is God, Cadmus said. Do none of you understand what government is? Government is a conspiracy of the decent against the lawless, against anarchy, against the primeval voice which shrieks from the woods. Oh, they'll call it liberation, but freedom soon becomes a slogan for brutal acts of retaliation. The name of God, spoken as a watchword for the settlement of old scores. You are right, we cannot arrest them all. We arrest the ringleader. The others do not matter. We capture this so-called self-styled god and we cut off his head. Cut the tail off the dog, the dog goes on living. But cut the head off the dog, the dog dies, and all his parasites die with him. All summer long we have prayed. Oh, Zeus, 
When shall the groaning earth receive its God? Give us, if not yourself, at least your holy seed. How else may be healed the savagery of this world? Did not heaven desire in love a mortal form? Was in this not shown the covenant between them? Dionysus the beautiful has come by love to redeem from the tomb. Zeus conceived him in heaven, in the star realm. But he was born of earth to Semele, the virgin. He blazed from the womb, horned like a ram, wearing upon his head a crown of living serpents. Provoked to jealousy by his miraculous beauty, the Titans laid violent hands upon his infant divinity. Tearing his lovely flesh and scattering it like grain. But there, where his body had been broken, the silent earth received him as a friend. And Dionysus did not die. But rose again from darkness, like a tree. At the shock of this pain, his heart learned wisdom. Thus he became a boy man. Sweet to look upon. Full of wounds. Full of suffering. Zeus put him to the gentle nursing of the nymphs of Nyssa, the sacred mountain. He grew there to manhood in guiltless freedom. Secret. Dissonant. And strong. As a reward to them for so loving him and serving him and feeding him. The sweet wild honey of Hymettus. Dionysus created for them. The sacrament of wine. wine. Which was not known among men until Dionysus brought it to them out of the east. Wine. wine. Which lends lightness to the mind in its heaviness. And to the body overborne by tiredness. Rest. And peace. Oh, now that the sweet of the summer comes on, women run to him. They abandon loom, abandon home. See how he draws them to him, like pollen out of the flower. Oh, he is as wild as the mountain stream falling in glory over smooth stones to the sea. The horned bull chewing the dark berry, the red berry in its green solitude. The hawk upon the stillness of the air, resolute, hungering for blood. To old men bending at their burden, weary of work, look. He will bring an end to the harsh, unyielding labour of their days. Here, in the consolation of the vine, they hear again... Voices under stone. Laughter in the deep wood. The long-looked-for promises of boyhood. Rejoice, we have seen them everywhere, these signs of the gods' glad magic. The calmness. The holiness. The devouring madness. The supple. Dangerous. Power. Cadmus, come on out! Bring your tambourine and flute. Let's join the dancing in the street. You lead, old friend. I'll follow. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be my eyes today, Cadmus? Where do you want to go? To the slopes of Kithiron, where the god was born. I cannot take you there. It has been forbidden. By who? By my grandson. The king. Listen to that beautiful girl. How can you know that she is beautiful? <laughs> In my life on this earth, by God's will, I have been both male and female. Feel. The goddess hero took my sight for boasting it. Zeus could not restore it. But the knowledge I gained has made me his prophet. Good night, we came and joy us out of the The soldiers are gone. This is the lover's time. Oh, Agave, oh, beautiful one, mother of the king, come with us and dance with us. Be light and footloose and joyous and carefree. Sisters, brothers, you know well how I long to come at your call. I, too, have tasted the freedom of the vine. The dark grape, the red grape, the blood, the holy thyrsus, the kingdom of easefulness and wine. 
My soul is faint with love for the new god Dionysus and the richness and goodness he brings us. But I cannot come yet. My child Pentheus the king is stricken with hatred. I cannot come before I have tried one final time to warn him, to persuade him to see sense. Oh, sisters, hear me. My body and womb are torn by their own secret cry. They ache with a melancholy which is part of becoming old, white-haired, spent, dry. This you also know is true, that life is not light or sweet, but bitter with private sorrow, that we labor from our youth for truth and fullness and happiness, but struggle and strain to no purpose. In this, Dionysus our Lord has heard us and walked with us. He has seen with what pain our hopes are cast down. Oh, the promise of release from this is like honey, like nakedness. Let the one who pities our tears receive us at the last with beauty and gentleness and purge us of all fear. This new god has come to turn the world upside down. The father will disown the son. The son will publicly condemn the mother. This disorder is not anarchy, as the king's men say. Today, all the old allegiances die. Hermos! Tiresias, you both disgrace the city, banging the drum, rattling the tambourine, decorating your hair with flowers, dancing in the public squares like carnival girls. Look at yourselves, garlands of leaves, women's clothes. My dearest grandson, please do not be angry at our levity. These clothes, which you call women's clothes, the soft pelt of the fawn, the ivy, and the bryony, which bloom to celebrate the spring, these things are outward forms. We wear them for devotion. Be aware, before you go further, I know the truth. I have been informed how you and those like you have chosen to honor this god. The depraved behavior high in the hills at night, in the blaze of the torches, Young girls, driven to the extremity of their senses by the frenzy of the drum, fucking in the bushes. The divine meal, the delight in animal blood, the mountain goat, its shoulder torn out, eaten still living during the long, insane, ecstatic dance. You have flushed with pleasure when the crowds acclaimed you. I warn you, do not deny this god, his love, his frenzy. He will not force chastity on women to satisfy your shame. In him they discover an emancipation of their own. Yes, it's true, they run naked for joy. But do not lie about their innocent ecstasy or condemn the divinity they affirm. Their hearts are holy and calm. If you provoke the people by your speeches, or even by your presence among them, you will be charged with the crime of attempting to raise a rebellion. You will be convicted, then executed. I am Tiresias. Throughout Greece, my prophecies are famous. You will hear them, Pentheus. I speak not as you, but as the gods direct. If the gods loved you, you would not be as you are, blind, crippled by sciatica, a walking colony of diseases offensive to the air. You say to men, beware, my magic is strong. But a priest or a prophet has no magic except his tongue. Recognize he has the experience of his years, as I do also, Pentheus. What is your counsel, then? It is simple. Dionysus is here. He is real. His magic is spreading like fire. It is felt in the earth, in the air. Worship him, grandson. You will not hold Thebes against him. Let me put the ivy crown upon your head. 
bow and receive this benediction from my hand, as you did at your coronation. There is nothing to be feared. Preserve us from the man who thinks he is a god. No wiser words were ever said. Open your eyes, Pentheus. A god who will bleed as we bleed has long been promised us. The world's tears and its blood are greater than its happiness. It is not in our nature to make the old order easy and lovely and light. A new truth, a new power must do it. Remember that you were king once and wore the blood of men upon your skin proudly like a badge. Do not think in old age it is your privilege to be squeamish. When the throne was yours, you held it as I do now, rigid as iron. If he is profane, unworthy of our praise, we will be forgiven. We showed respect to what we thought was sacred. We did no wrong. We submitted our hearts to God. What is God? No one knows. A lucky charm against the world's indifference. The revenge of fantasy upon common sense. I'll tell you what God is. What God can do. Because I know I am an old man, which means I never sleep properly. In summer, the heat wakes me early. In winter, the cold seeps into my bones. All day, all night, I feel the pain running along my old, tired limbs, my old back, my old neck. I detest old age, its strain, its indignity. There's no bench which doesn't give injury to this worn-out mockery of a body. Yet, last night, for the first time in 45 years, I slept as soundly as a child does, without pain, without care. The God has touched me. His touch has healed me. This new God Dionysus is my own grandson. He is Samele's child, she whose death in fire cast a shadow over my early days as king. At first I thought the stories of his birth were rumors and lies, woven to console me for my daughter's bad death. Now I see that they are all true. Dionysus is here in Thebes, and here he is teaching us a new dance of ecstasy. Let us dance, let us stamp our feet, let us be wild and jubilant and generous with wine. Let us dare to be fools as the truly good are, and dance to our folly, and let us eat everything sweet and ripe and lovely. Ah, oh, give me a drum, I'll beat it, <laughs> I won't get tired. I'll never tire again this side of the grave, which no longer holds any of its yawning, gaping fear for me. There is a universal law. It underpins us all. The law is this, that death is final. Nothing endures. Not on earth nor in heaven is there anything made which we can call eternal. All matter, all that is, falls and fades and vanishes. Each soul had its being before time began. It has passed already through many worlds, and it will pass in the future through many more. As the vine seeded in the earth rises again to new growth, shall not the soul of man or woman enter by rebirth a new body, a new life? If anyone presumes to teach that the soul lives after death and is reborn to life, they will be executed at once. For what crime? Must they die, Pentheus? For the most serious vanity a man may commit, pretending that mere opinion is certainty. Dionysus proclaims it. All Greece believes it. All Greece accepts it. Everywhere except Thebes. Why is that? Thebes is sane. You were not born when Simele died. How can you say? That there was no miracle. Because it is impossible. Because such things do not happen except in dreams. Can Zeus, at his pleasure, at 
will, at whim, violate every law which governs the material world? God can do anything. A virgin girl who gives birth is not a virgin, but a liar. And if she gives birth, her child is a bastard, not the son of God. No, Pentheus, you are wrong. Hear us. In the beginning, God and the earth, what is above and what is below, found beauty in one another and loved one another. And soon what had been divine desired to live in bodily form and was made mortal as man. Corporeal, like the earth. And leaden as the earth. And, moulded by injury and wrong, it grew sullen and sorrowing. And therefore its life became... Not life, but death. Pitiless as flame. And the terrestrial world groaned beneath the burden of blood. So, the divine spirit in the mind of mortal men and women... The spirit which had known God and seen him and walked with him in heaven... Pleaded with him in lamentation... For the beauty that was despoiled by life... The capacity that was wasted by life... The body that was torn and ruined by life... But yet took satisfaction in destruction... And it cried to God and said... Oh, let there be some part of the divine power created to live upon the earth to instruct us. Let the spirit of sympathy, which is the light of the sun... The harmony of the stars... And the love between what is above and what is below... Transform and redeem. Let, let God be made man. Help us. Set us free. We are not gods, but desire to be. We are not divine but composed of divinity. This is the meaning of the story of Zeus and Semele. These know him best. Listen to them, Pentheus. From the beginning they have greeted him with frenzied acclamation. They've cast flowers down as a carpet in front of him. They've followed him and loved him. Your own mother, hearing them, believed and became one of them. Yes, I am betrayed by those who should love me. My own blood family, my mother, as you say, my own mother, Agave. Even she is disloyal to me. For shame! All of you, down on your knees! No, my son, I will no longer kneel to you. I have been silent long enough, and have listened long enough to your slanders and lies, the language you habitually use to bully and intimidate. For shame! You accuse us without cause. Those who are initiated are bound by this promise of their faith, which they affirm before the God in these words. I swear to give up my life for the salvation of my brothers and sisters who constitute the whole of mankind and, if called upon, to die in the defense of truth. We are not brothers but competitors. Law, power, wealth, only these are strength. There is no law or power or wealth which will endure. There is only truth. Truth? What is truth? A word as light as the feather of a duck. Oh, you are cruel and harsh. And oh, I ask how. How is it possible I gave you birth? You who are young and strong, but not like a young man, feeling no need of a lover, denying nature. You make a bed of your own intolerance and anger. Did you not rear me to be as I am? I do as a ruler should. I bind with tough and biting penalties he who is lazy, he who is weak, he who in his heart nurses evil intent. Yes, and these laws have filled up your prisons and sent many incontinent with fear to the axe or the gallows. If you had seen what I have seen, faces ringed by exhaustion or pain, the burnt-out slave, his life a futile, shaken fist, the ruined girl, pregnant, abandoned, unmarriageable, kneeling under the stars, her eyes solemn with longing, drawn by the moon's magnetism upward to the mysteries. I am guilty, too. I was young. I was wealthy. I had no feeling of this. I was the daughter of a king. I despised those whose hands were dirty. I was proud of birth and beauty. I spoke as you speak today, arrogantly. 
but I was wrong. Mother, I forbid you ever to approach me again. The city must be protected, the law upheld. As for these women who follow the new god, the superstition of wine and blood, this is my final word. Arrest them. By their assembly here, they have forfeited their freedom. Let the prisons be made ready to receive them. You speak without understanding, embracing your own ruin. You were weak once, and then you loved me. Now, grown strong, you repudiate me, not knowing the bitter struggle of your nativity, nor caring what need I felt between mind and womb to love you and conceive you and bear you and bring you into the light. But I see that my agony meant nothing to you. This is true. In the mountains, the God releases us. The wildness of the place, the emptiness of it, sets free our sacred frenzy without doing harm. No man or woman whose nature is evil can serve the God or come at his call. They slander us who talk of violence and excess. The world is a prison house. All my life I've longed to be free of it, but free of what I did not know or guess until this moment. My place is not here, Pentheus, in your palace, but high in the hills, upon the long, tall grass. You are my son, but you have disowned me. Be no longer anything to do with me. Well, sir, Dionysus is here. We have apprehended him. The god was not difficult to find. High in the hills, evidence of his activities is everywhere. The trees are draped with garlands. The fires which decorate the night are not put out. The embers still smoke. The smell of freshly cooked meat hangs in the air. Some of the women, I am certain, had eaten the raw narcotic mushroom. They formed a circle around us, their painted faces staring at us, their eyes full of animal insolence. Or they were singing some chant or song to power of sun or influence of moon, clapping their hands, tossing back their heads to shout in violent rhythm to the god. Sir, I looked as closely as I dared to see what kind of people these were. Sir, of what you have suspected, Debauchery, drunkenness, licentious perversion, there was no mark or trace. But then, oh, sir, a voice spoke out of nowhere, out of the air. Stroke the rock, and like an udder, it will give you milk. Touch the tree, and lo, it will bring forth miraculous honey. As he had said it would be, so it became. Otanoe, your mother's sister, bent her face to the rock and began to lick it like a cat. I saw her mouth, bright with milk. I saw it. Another woman struck the trunk of a cedar with the pine-tipped thyrsus, the staff of power. At once the tree dripped gold with honey. It bled into their hands, which they had cupped to receive it. I thought, this is a dream. Wake up, I thought. Wake up. But I could not wake. It, it was real. It was really happening. Sir, I beg you to believe me, truly. This God, this new God, in all his beauty, he is God's own son. This is the high season of the summer. Everywhere there is a deep heat. For 15 days the skies have been bare of cloud. No rain has fallen. Even the cicada under the dry stone is parched and longs for water. Yet, wherever the song of Dionysus is heard, in the woods... The fields and the valleys, the earth teems with promiscuous life. There is a wetness in the picked grape, moisture, and a smell both warm and cool, oozing from root and the branches that bear fruit. No words from you, Tiresias. Your mouth is full of the toxic smell of vegetable gas. What will you do next? Thrust your bony fingers up some slaughtered chicken's ass, then solemnly inform us that the day of doom is close. It were better for you, you glib and immature boy, to forfeit your sight like me. 
then you will never see what will be done ritually to cleanse you of your blasphemy. A day is coming, fool, it is almost upon you, when the God whom you say does not exist, Dionysus, the virgin born, God's own son, will walk bareheaded into thieves and claim it as his own. If you do not, that day, that hour, receive him and worship him at the temple and at every holy shrine, then he or those who follow and love him will rip your profane body limb from limb. Nothing will remain of you or what your mother loved except your severed head. Be warned, you child posturing as a man, pretending to an authority no mortal king can possess. I do not bluff. Deny the God, ignore prophetic word. Soon you will be whimpering that I saw everything clear and plain enough. That is more like it. Finally, you sound like a prophet. A prophet about to suffer a terrible death for his belief. Look. He is here. Footfall at evening brings him out of ambiguous shadows. At last he is here among us, his long hair dusted with poppy flowers. He blows upon the rust color of the dry earth, his seed awakening breath. Worship him. Oh, Dionysus. I was beautiful. I was God's own son. I threatened long-held power, and so they tore me and destroyed me. But my heart could not be buried in the sullen earth of winter, and the darkness of the tomb could not contain it. Therefore I arose from the wreckage of my persecution like the undefeated dawn, like the violence of the sun. Who are you? I am the incarnate Son of God, the Lord Dionysus. Behold. Although I come to Thebes in human form, appearing to mortal eyes as a mortal man, yet do not mistake me. My nature is not gentle. It is like fire or a flaming sword. No. You are a mortal man and your body is susceptible to pain. Hold him. <laughs> Hypocrite. You sit in judgment over me according to the law, and then in defiance of the law you strike me. I am king. It is my prerogative to strike you or to kill you or to set you free. I come to warn you, Pentheus, do not make war upon a god. It is stupid and perverse. Is it not perverse for a god to consort with criminals and drink wine to excess? Look, in the king's presence you were drunk or you were drugged. In this way, or in some other way, much worse than this, trafficking perhaps with a demon, you have hallucinated this god, this new obscene religion. Tell me then my felony, and how you will punish me. We shall crop bare your long and lascivious hair. My hair is God-given, you blaspheme to despoil a gift of heaven. Next you will surrender that obscene staff of power. Then take it from me and break it if you dare. You are going chained to a prison where your body will be broken. You will not keep me there. I say at God's command, your prison doors will open. I say you have forgotten the harm which the power of a king can do to a man. You are wrong. You have no power that is your own. Power is from God alone. How do I know that what you say is true? Others have told you what should have convinced you. You offer no proof. You threaten, you bluff. No, I have spoken with authority from heaven. Show me, if you can, the power by which you come. Think what you have seen in vision, nightmare, and dream. Oh, beware. I saw his magic once in Lydia at a village there. The god looked then like a child or a very young man, but delicate as a girl. A crowd, curious of his fame, gathered to see him and hear him. It included an old man. The village schoolmaster. Who, finding something in the boy's appearance and speech offensive, or otherwise not to his liking, he began to insult him and threaten him. And then he attempted to administer a beating to him. He took hold of the boy by his long, bright hair. And seizing a rod lifted it above his head to strike. He shouted then as if he had been stung. The rod was rippling and curling with vine leaves. The man tried to swing his arm but could not. It had become knotted and gnarled like the branch of a tree. Next he was aware 
that his legs had thickened and joined, that his feet had penetrated the earth as roots. If any thought then entered his brain of pleading to the god for mercy. By now he was too far gone. Every part of him. His face. His hair. His limbs. Even his clothes. All of them were the texture not of flesh and blood, but, but of, of wood. wood. Oh, believe me. What I have seen with open eyes, I offer freely for your scrutiny. These are not lies. Sir, the place where these mysteries were fulfilled is sacred still. Ivy crowns the tree. Garlands hang there all the year. Woven out of herbs and flowers. And dedicated to the power of the gentle, savage god. We are a civilized people. Our minds are sophisticated. Let other nations worship their lustful or vicious gods. Here in Thebes we have no liking for these corrupting extremes. Thebes breeds men. Self-disciplined, self-reliant, dutiful and strong. Let other nations ponder the nature of divinity. Let them become weaker. The world we see and touch is our father. It is harsh and hard enough. Let us not construct another above the clouds, beyond the rainbow span. I say that when religion takes root among men, disaster follows, lunacy, excess, degradation. Is it not enough for us to be mortal and stand on the earth alone for a time? Must we be gods and claim to know what never can be known? Things are hidden only to be revealed and made secret only to be brought to light. Salvation is through knowledge. Knowledge is what has always been, but what you, the living, have hidden. Resurrection is the revelation of this truth. Be no longer divided from God. God is seeded in every conscious mind. Blood and bone dissolve in the tomb, but spirit shall be free and fair, like light penetrating the air. As branches, silver with hoarfrost, gather moonlight against the darkness, so the human soul in life draws truth to itself against death. But for you, you vain and impious man, discover for yourself what is forbidden. Guards, convey him to prison. And from thence, let him be taken to some proper place of execution. Put your chains upon my holy limbs, then you make by your arrogance a reckoning with Zeus. Deny to his son, the Lord Dionysus, honor and reverence, then look to feel his violent anger break like thunder over your obdurate head. Your body will be torn, like the eagle in the storm. Do not doubt the justice of my word. Everything will fall out as I have said. I am an old man. Old age has taught me one thing, that we know nothing. What we know, we only think we know. Certainty is not truth, but conviction of truth. Last night's dream was real enough when you slept it and dreamt it. Life is as light as a feather, if only we could see it. I beg you, therefore, see sense. Consider for once the possibility that you are mistaken in your hostility. Do not treat this new god disrespectfully. Surely it is a small thing, a prudent thing, to receive him courteously, whoever he is, whoever he may be. If there is a god, why should he come to earth in this disguise? Why dress in these effeminate clothes? Why associate not with a king, but with a criminal and the reprobate? Release him, grandson. If this god is a true god, he would speak to me first, not last. Release him! This is the man to whom you gave your throne. You did wrong, Cadmos. He's young, clever, strong, but he's not fit to be king. He is king because he is strong, and we sleep safe because he is strong. 
Of all my children and grandchildren, only Pentheus was fit to wear the crown. I do not say that he is gentle, good, or wise. I say his strength has been like a hammer to our enemies. Take this self-styled prophet and escort him to the gates of the city. <laughs> no! Do not handle him roughly. For my grandfather's sake, I deal with you gently. But never in my lifetime will you enter Thebes again. You are right. I will not. You are lucky. Go. As for you, followers of Dionysus, prepare yourselves. Tomorrow at dawn, you march to the gallows. Hear them as they come in, the already dead, the calm condemned. Observe the brightness of their eyes, their skin. Death has not yet withdrawn from them the living sheen on every created thing. Although they sing, listen. The tread of their feet is an anthem. Ruin lies upon them, new minted and clean. What is left for them now? The moon, pale at dawn? The moment of preparation. Then the short walk out into the sun. Memory and time bending to nothing. The sunlight will scatter their souls like birds from the trees. When they hang in the bold blue morning. To the patter of the drum. O oh, virgin-born, god-born Dionysus, they are your children. See how they are suffering. How this king oppresses them. Hear them this bitter night. And redeem. Thunder. Tell me what has happened. Sir, there has been an earthquake. It struck the southern part of the city shortly after midnight. Mm. The walls of the prison were shaken to their foundations. There was widespread panic. The gates broke open. The guards fled. The prisoners are free. Free? All of them, sir. Singing could be heard coming from their cell. Then there was a flash. Every door and gate burst open wide. The chains which bound each prisoner shattered as if they had been made of glass. The jailer woke with a scream. Seeing what had happened, and assuming that his prisoners had escaped, he looked at once for a sword with which to kill himself. A voice called out to him, Sir, do yourself no harm. We are not gone. You are not to blame. The God's holy will has been done. At this, the jailer knelt and asked forgiveness of the prisoner, who lifted him up and gave him the kiss of peace. The danger for us, sir, is this. He said it would happen. It has. Animals can feel the imminence of thunder many hours before it strikes. I've seen it myself. The horse is restless in the field, the kitchen cat suddenly moving to retrieve its kittens, the heavy stillness which falls silencing the birds. To predict disturbance in the weather is not magic, but a long-practiced country art. Let us not be deceived by these tricks. Who guarded the gatehouse? Answer my question. Sir, an old man, a slave, unfit for any other employment. In your grandfather's day, he gave good service, but his strength and capacity are gone. Other men would pay him to sit and take their turn for them. The old man would agree he wanted the money. He has kept watch over Thebes for the last time. Sir, under your discretion, the fault was not his. The fault lay with other men. That is no concern of mine. He was there. He takes the blame. The others also will be punished. Bring me the name of every guilty man. Sir. Sir. I have worn out the bright promise of my days for you, Pentheus. To me, your thick city walls are a luxury. They do not protect me. If they fell, then I would be what I dream of being, Pentheus. Free. Free to follow the rising sun at dawn. Free to return at evening from fields of my own which I would till with my own hands. Free to refuse the persuasions of a king 
a manacle biting like a claw at my ankle, the lash burning the persistence of your task into my soul's muted as flesh, the mud made bare clad hovel home you stable me in, the earth I sleep hard upon, which denies me the warm cedar wood, the cool stone of the village I grew up in, the stream, the water mill, the forest, the ripeness upon the corn at harvest, the long lost loveliness of a woman whose form my eyes retain before sleep in your darkness. Look, you have whittled away the brief years of my beauty, Penthes, the days when my body, my bones, my teeth were still animal strong, the season when my heart might have sung love songs of its own. These should have been as a gift to manhood in manhood's prime from the gods in heaven. Once these were mine, Pentheus, they will not come again. Instead, you tore me unregarding out of childhood and set me to work at your ramparts, turning the stones for your endless iron roads, digging the filthy, intractable earth to find spaces for the airless dungeon houses which filled your dreams. Oh, Pentheus, because of your sullen ambition, I have never known holiday, festival, feast day, marriage day, day of child's nativity, any day which the gods ordain, so that love may live among us and nurse us gently to hope. Oh, it is hard and ugly to see how corroding time eats youth away, how strength and capacity are nothing, only promises broken by captivity. In your service we live not as men, but as ghosts. Look, though we die swift as the wildflower under the frost, yet in our death we are happy. We lose only our misery, poverty and slavery. These who are not secure, not contented, these look to the sky and bless the whirlwind. They hear below the horizon the vibration of the tiger's paw, the rhythm of the war drum. They do not curse them. They rejoice. They know that nothing will ever change for them without the catalyst of ruin. Who are you? My doors are guarded and locked. How did you get in? I can pass at will through solid stone. And you are a phantom. Touch me. I am real. <laughs> you speak the truth. I was told that the prisoners had escaped. They think they have cheated me. But I know what they are doing. What are they doing? They are worshipping their god in unnatural ways. They lie on their backs under the stars. Their prayers are prayers of licentiousness. They think that joy and idleness fit together like gloves. I will go to Kithiron. I will see for myself what is being done. There I will arrest them. They will know by your clothes that you are the king. I will dress as they do. I will dress as a woman. They are many. You are one. They are weak. No, they are strong. You have oppressed them beyond reason. You have put this mania into them. They raised rebellion. They have done the city harm. I am here to warn. These are my own. 
hurt none of them. They have eaten the bread which is my flesh. They have drunk the wine which is my blood. You seek to obstruct me in the execution of my authority. I warn you, I will kill the man who stands in my way. I will not prevent you. How may that be? A god cannot die. But life is soon beaten from the frame of a man. Then your magic is nothing. Only emptiness. It is what it is, Pentheus. Do not touch these. They are mine. To me they came running like bride to groom. Our slavery is broken, they sang. Earth is given in marriage to heaven. Their hearts were leaping for love and love's intoxication. You alone have spoken against them and declared the wedding is not lawful. The guests shall be barred, the music silenced, and the house darkened as if for a funeral. And now they dance their freedom in thorn brake and forest, where Orpheus once brought music to charm the stubborn wilderness of elm and oak and merciless climbing ivy. There, by the sweetness of his melody, he gathered the creatures to him, releasing them from the burden of age-old savagery with song and intimations of wild, ecstatic joy. All these I protect, and every blow which you inflict falls upon me, and I suffer it as mine. Every time you kill a man, the wine I delight in turns to blood, and the blood is my blood. Why? They are slaves. They are women. I am in the slave more than in the free man. I am in the one who starves more than in the one who is sufficient. Understand, you and the beggar and the broken and the condemned are one. When you are as they are, then you will be whole. Who are you? I am the corn threshed upon the threshing floor. I am the vine cropped and pruned to nothing. I am the dead man who lives and is eternally young. I have seen the torches burn to herald the dawn. I have heard the voices moan in ecstasy or pain. What magic or what ritual does the night conceal? The god's effigy is garlanded with flowers and hung upon a tree. Then it is buried under stone, where for three days and nights it must remain. On the third day, before dawn, a lighted torch is carried to the tomb. There, the initiated one witnesses in flame the miracle of life's resurrection. Is there meaning in an effigy? A wooden nothing? No. You play at immortality as children do. How may thought acknowledge what lies beyond the scope of language unless the heart is free by image to see as the eye sees? Oh, witness, these things which are enacted, these are the shadows and shapes which redeem. You lie. Rise at dawn. Ride out above the city as I have often done. Observe. Peaceful in the morning, the wooded hill below the summit of Kithiron. Yet, in every bush, in every ditch, under every blade of grass, the beetle is eaten. The ant and fly are consumed by the agile spider. Out of the air, the predatory bird brings death in a coil of movement. The snail is smashed from its shell. The scurrying mouse, the lingering earthworm, they perish like trash. If these creatures could scream, our ears would drown in their din. And this is the world which you say God is master of. Sit with me, as my brother at meat. Feed upon the fruit of my heart. Look. You are bleeding. Your body is running with blood. It is wine, Pentheus. Do not pursue the limiting pleasure 
but the infinite joy. Abandon desire while you lust after this thing or that thing. You forget what is most holy, the universal everything. Have no allegiance to country. All countries are God's country. Nor to city, nor to tribe, nor to leader, nor to king. Your loyalty and love must be to all men, not to one man. To the light in every created being. Remember, none are above you and none below you. In doing violence to either, you do violence to your soul. Let the radiance of God burn within in every task you perform. This is freedom, this is joy, which even death cannot destroy. Love others. Love again. Love me. You are preaching anarchy. I will see you stripped naked and nailed to a tree. I am like a reflecting glass. In me, every man will see himself. Sir, I must speak what I have witnessed. Where is my grandson? Pentheus, the king. Pentheus, our king, your grandson. He is dead. The women, the, the god brood, they have murdered him. Often what comes to pass is what we have feared the most. Say how this happened. The king rose long before dawn. He dressed without summoning his slaves. He put on the robes his mother Agave had worn when she was a young woman. He anointed his hair with oil and myrrh and drew shapes with paint around his eyes, shadowing them as a woman does. Then, concealed in a heavy cloak, he went up to the summit of Kitharon, alone and on foot, instructing us to remain below. The god-mad women whom we had come to see were sitting or lying among the pines at the hill's crest, strewn in their nakedness like discarded clothes. Some were asleep, contented, exhausted. Others were doing simple work, mending what was broken, stitching, cooking. As the sun came up, one by one they awoke, or put aside what they were doing. They gathered in a circle, raising their hands to the dawn, and began to chant. The noise ebbed and flowed like the sea. The great, wide, deep, dark, interminable, ever-rolling sea. Then the god was there. He moved among them through the long, tall grasses. I saw him clearly, as clear and sharp and real to me as my own fingernails. I watched the king as he drew closer and closer. Because of his disguise, his heavy robes, his painted face, none of them noticed or sensed the danger. There was a gasp from the women as he struck the god upon the head with a rock. He shouted, Beauty is a fragile thing. Look, it can be made ugly in a moment. The god did not return the blow. The king struck him again. I saw the bright flash of blood on his skin. Then the king drew a sword from under his robe. He seized the god by his hair. He held it tight, tight as a knot in his fist of iron, and he raised the sword to strike. I closed my eyes. I could not look. I did not want to see this obscenity the severing of a living man. But I knew that the king had struck the blow because I heard a scream, an extraordinary scream. Suddenly all the women were screaming. I could feel the vibration of it in my body, their fury at the desecration of what had been beautiful, at the strong man and the strong man's power to hurt and maim and kill. 
kill, which, being women, many knew well, many had known it from the cradle, that strength which, by subduing the body, can break also the will and the soul. Oh, I heard their howl, ringing in the air above me, reverberating in the earth below my feet, voices which had understood that salvation was slipping away from them, back into dream, back into the silence of useless suffering. I lost control of my stomach then, and I was sick into the long grass. For a time, the noise went on and on, and, and yet now it was not like grief anymore. It was harsh and rhythmical, wild, mad singing. God has arisen. God has arisen. Our Lord is great. Our Lord is full of light. When I was able again to stand and see, I saw why. The women were swaying and dancing. They were drinking what looked like wine. Their clothes, their faces were spattered with it, but it wasn't wine. It was blood. Agave, the king's mother, sat cross-legged on the earth, her eyes shut, her mouth wide open. She was filthy and naked, chanting, keening some heavenly hymn. Do you know, can you imagine what was lying in her lap. The severed head of Pentheus, her son. They had dismembered him as if he was an animal. As for the god, there was nothing, no trace of him. I'd watched him fall. I'd seen his dark flesh fouled with blood, but now there was nothing. Only the singing and a strange, sweet smell like new-baked bread or fermenting wine, and the light, the light was vibrating. It shimmered like a galaxy of dragonflies. What of my daughter? Speak. I need to hear. For long minutes I watched her as she stared at it, this ruined thing, her child, her king, those finally silent lips calm, unmoving at last, until she recognized what it was. At this coherence, she began to scream and scream. Someone gave her ale to drink, mixed with herbs and poppy juice. She fell under the narcotic into a moaning, slumberous trance where mind pain and heart pain were dulled but the image of what had been persisted on the retina and pierced the brain. Where is she now? Sir, outside the city gate. She has washed herself clean, shorn off her hair, put on her funeral clothes. Listen to them. They are rioting. A day ago our walls stood secure. The city of Thebes was unassailable. They have murdered the lawful king. They will pay. It would take a brave man to enforce the law at such a time. The last sound I heard from the king's mouth was a cry. It was almost of pleasure, as if he was pleased to discover that these people who had preached holiness so fervently were finally acting as he thought that all act violently. I often heard him say, God is a lie. Violence is this world's reality. But God is not a lie. Pentheus is dead. Those he condemned, they are free. Dionysus told the king to punish no one, but the king could not learn the lesson. In life, in death, you get what you have given. Easy to love ourselves, I know, but if we can learn to love the hostile, ugly, strange, resistant other, and say, stranger, you laugh, you suffer, but I know why. I am you. You are me. And surely we will live on earth like gods. No. If we have any sense remaining, let us confess. The holiness of God's word 
cannot mean this. They should not have killed him. They should have done as the god had done and laid down their own lives. But their lives were dear to them. I'm leaving Thebes. I'm going to the woods. Let this god be honored, whatever we may think of him, whatever he has cause to be done. Here he was born. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Everything in my life has been a mystery to me. Until today. Lord, we loved you. We worshipped you. How then could you permit this evil thing to come to pass? The gods care nothing for human happiness, which passes as the seasons. From cradle to grave they instruct us through suffering, because they would have us learn the hard lesson of wisdom. I watched him grow. I watched you take him from me. I saw you train him for rigor and decision. Was his spirit capable of love? I know he loved only what obsessed him. His mind was too quick for feeling. Even as a child, he had no patience with slowness. His thoughts were swift and harsh. They outran my indulgence. But he loved you, Cadmus, for your unbending strength which compelled his respect. Often I wished him what he never was or became, loose-limbed and grinning, half boy, half man, tied to nothing, as footloose as a god, always roaming where a high, bright, dusty sun would turn all accident to fortune, always returning, like the pale star at evening, to throw his cloak of warmth over the mundane daily grief of loneliness and middle age. I am to blame. I dreamed a dream of a son. Not him. Not the man he became. At what moment does a life change from blessing to curse? To do what I did, I must have held him close. Of this embrace I have no memory. Only my hands reeking of his blood. What god can alter the brutality of fact? You could not have known what your hands were doing. A cat must be separated a long time from her kittens before she forgets them. Did I forget what no mother has ever forgotten? The face and form of her own son. We have all been insane. When I saw what I had done, I was given poppy juice to make me sleep. While I slept, I entered the house of the dead. I was walking in a place open, like a meadow or hill. Far below me, a sea was beating upon a shingle beach. Everything in that place was alive. But it had life in a fashion different from our own. The sea lapped the shore because it pleased the sea to do so. The grass under my feet grew because it wished to grow. I walked for a time. I do not know how long. As I walked, I knew that Pentheus, my son, was walking beside me. I turned to look at him, but wept. My eyes were blinded and I could not speak. He told me he had woken in this place suddenly, cold and frightened. He said that at first he had not known that he was dead. Seeing that I could not reply, he tried to comfort me. He said, 
that because I had loved him, I had chosen to live at his side, as his mother, as his destroyer. He said that the pattern of our existence was not ended, that our strife had meaning. It would be better for him, he said, after the toil of the blood and the blood's bitter wastefulness, to grow in the earth as a tree. There he might become simple and slow and calm, nourished by creatures which crawl or climb. Oh, mother, he said, do not weep for me. A tree feels no grief, no animosity. Live on the earth, be free, but pray for my soul. Remember me. Dreams are not real, but the lies they tell allow us to endure what is real. I pray that my hope is not false. I pray that knowledge and not darkness lies in the grave. Resurrection. Daughter, we must never hope to see each other again. You cannot remain in Thebes. You have killed the lawful king. You are banished. My guilt is terrible. I make no complaint. For you, Agave, exile and the trouble of soul which will break, then release. But for us, no grief at this. Only the simplicity of another naked day. The heat's force no longer wearisome. No sickness to our tired eyes from the sun at the meridian. The stubborn plow motionless, unsweated over. And the field. The thick, ripe fur like grass, like corn. Its sway indolently mirroring the wind-borne configurations of clouds. Is untenanted and undented. Oh, listen. Now you can hear the corn growing. In its own power, the God's power. Where is God? Where can we find him? In living, within the enduring. In the dissolution of the heart's ambition. Be wise, therefore, and by wisdom see that only the long journey of the soul is a reality. Too long I have been a crucible for ambition and trouble. Life was the contention I wrought from contradiction. Let the demon in my humanity dissolve into vacancy, and the wind and the storm beat over my brain till the tough air scour clean what protesting stubbornness of flesh could not vanquish. And in the heat of it, remember, all this ragged weather is transient as fire. One day it must be swept bare of its energy, its loud toil as void as a forgotten quarrel. And sun and stars also shall fall lame and dwindle, finally, to ghost and shell. And then shall all, even the dissonance of the soul, be infinitely still. You lived in chains, I came to you. You called upon my power to release you. But you are mortals, not gods. You act as mortals do. I cannot make you moral, good, and pure. For all your feeling, you are purblind and stubborn. You look for a map to show you what is right or wrong, but will not learn from your own pain. Accordingly, with every self-willed breath, you bring yourselves and each other to grief. You complain that God has lied to you. God is not the liar. You are. 
Find salvation in the soul's decision. Respect as yourself every creature with life. In loving others, be as a god is. Leave Thebes. Leave your city. There are loyalties deeper than blood or family. Be poor. Be simple. Be like the beast of burden. Be an exile from everything you have called home. And follow me. God, like we came and joy us out of the womb. Not grief found and jealous, but open and full of song. Not to play a world do we belong, but to a realm of angelic bliss. To the blinding brightness will we return at last. In Dionysus by Andrew Rissick, Paul Schofield was Cadmus, Diana Rigg, Agave, Toby Stevens, Pentheus, and Chiwetel Ejiofor, Dionysus. Lycurgus was played by Roger Allam, Critias by Pip Donaghy, and Polybus by Bruce Purchase. Tiresias was Geoffrey Cassoon, and the condemned slave, Trevor Martin. The chorus leader was Anna Carteret, with Mia Soterio, Mally Harris and Yolanda Vasquez. The music was composed by Mia Soterio and performed by Mia Soterio, Steve Bentley Klein and William Lyons. Technical presentation was by Peter Ringrose and Simon Moorcroft. The director was Jeremy Mortimer. <laughs>